Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's HR Power Hour. My name is Vaughn Lanier and I am the HR Service Center Consultant at CoAdvantage. CoAdvantage is the leading provider for payroll, benefits, risk, and human resources. Um, now today we are presenting employment law and exclusive look at new regulations. Um, before we get started, I just want to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. And what we'll do is we'll bring them up towards the end of the presentation during the questions and answer section. Today's webinar will also be available online after this live session. And next, we will just go over our legal disclaimer. This webinar is intended to provide general best practices and employment guidance. CoAdvantage does not render legal advice. This document was not prepared by attorneys, and the delivery of this document does not constitute the provision of legal counsel. A little bit about CoAdvantage. CoAdvantage is one of top six professional employer organizations. We help small and mid-sized businesses by handling their human resources needs such as payroll, benefits, risk management, and HR administration. We serve nearly 4,500 clients and approximately 90,000 employees. We also have offices located in states such as California, Colorado, Florida, New Jersey, and Texas, and we are continuously growing. If you would like to know more about CoAdvantage, we invite you to our website and or um, one of our many social media outlets. Okay, so I am now going to hand things over to Brett, uh, my co-presenter, so that he can further introduce himself and we will, and he's going to present the rest of the webinar today. Uh, thank you, Vaughn. Um, my name is uh, Brett Yaw, and I am a counsel uh, level attorney with the law firm of Ford Harrison. Um, Ford Harrison is a um, uh, management side labor and employment firm. Uh, we have approximately 200 lawyers uh, in approximately 30 offices nationwide. Uh, we also maintain an international presence uh, through the Global Alliance of Use Laboris, assisting uh, clients uh, all over the world. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about 2019 and beyond. This is really going to be your labor and employment and HR law update of things that have happened um, up through today um, from 2018, early part of 2019, and really a look to where we're going to go into the future. And the road we're going to travel today is we're really going to focus on uh, the three branches of government. We're going to look at the judicial branch. We're going to talk about the judges. Uh, we're going to look at the legislative branch. That's our politicians. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at the executive branch. That's the president and his agencies. And those agencies include the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, as well as the Department of Labor. Uh, and then we are going to get into some questions uh, if you have them and certainly answers uh, to those questions. And with that, we will get started uh, with the judicial branch. And really what we're looking at right now is the makeup of the Supreme Court. Um, as you can see, um, the, the court is fully constituted after uh, some, some vacancies um, this term. Uh, the uh, uh, letter designation beside each justice's name uh, is their political uh, affiliation, uh, and the number next to it is their age. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see right now um, we have a, a, some, some justices on the younger spectrum as well as um, those like Justice Breyer, Justice Ginsburg, uh, that have been on the court for quite a bit of time. Recently, um, and I don't think it should be any surprise to anybody on the webinar today, uh, the court added two new associate justices uh, during Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, that's Associate Justice Neil Gorsuch and recently Justice uh, Neil, or excuse me, Justice uh, Kavanaugh. Uh, and uh, 
this is important now because the court is now leaning right with five Republicans uh, and four Democratic members. Um, and you might say to yourself, well, Brett, you know, I, I thought that, that as justices, we have these impartial individuals who are not swayed by politics. And that is certainly true, but um, the, the notion of judicial politics is important to understand where these justices fall um, with their political ideology. Um, because it gives a good indicator uh, as to how they will rule uh, when certain issues come up. So right now, the court is more skewed in a conservative direction uh, after several years of either uh, a more liberal bent um, or having a, a really one true swing vote. Significantly, and I, I, this hasn't been um, played up nearly enough, I, I don't think, but the Trump administration has more than doubled the number of judges it confirmed to the federal appeals court in 2018. Uh, that's exceeded the pace of the last five presidents. Uh, so right now, uh, the Trump administration has 90 confirmed um, uh, federal judges. Uh, Twelve circuit courts are now composed of more than 25 percent of Trump appointed judges. Um, 35 of those were confirmed. And the most significant changes um, are in the Eighth Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, the Fifth Circuit, and the Third Circuit. And you can see the states that belong to each of those circuits. So as we see, the Trump administration, um, for all of the, the gridlock that we hear about uh, in Congress, has done a very good job of essentially remaking the judiciary in the ways that, that it, it, it believes is appropriate um, by actually nominating and having these judges confirmed uh, for the bench. So really what we're seeing, not only at the Supreme Court level where uh, the Trump administration has now placed two um, Supreme Court justices, we're also seeing the federal court system being remade um, by these, these applicants, or excuse me, these, uh, these uh, uh, nominees who are then confirmed. I want to briefly touch upon some, some Supreme Court decisions that were released uh, in, within the past year uh, that I think have a, a large effect, uh, certainly on what we do in the labor and employment human resources world. Uh, but first is Encino Motor Cars versus Navarro, uh, which was uh, released on April 2nd of 2018. That was a five to four decision. Uh, and the ruling of, uh, of that uh, that case, the court rejected this narrow construction principle as a useful guidepost for interpreting the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, and instead adopting a more fair interpretation approach. This is really significant because since the 1940s, the Supreme Court has narrowly construed exemptions under the FLSA against the employer. And this narrow construction meant that unless the exemption for one of those um, uh, white collar exemptions, the executive, the administrative, the learned professional, uh, even those like the outside sales, the, com uh, the computer professional, um, those exemptions under the FLSA were narrowly construed against the employer, meaning if there was any sort of, I don't know how this looks, that it would fall against the exemption. Now, with uh, Justice uh, uh, Thomas, who had uh, issued this, uh, uh, who had authored the majority opinion, what we're looking at is what is fair, what makes sense with respect to the regulations. Um, so this is really now a lower burden uh, for employers to prove exemptions, which certainly helps when trying to make those tough calls about does this position satisfy the duties test associated with the applicable exemption? Another big ruling was in Epic Systems, um, where the court found, again, in a five to four decision, that employers do not violate the National Labor Relations Act if they make employees sign arbitration agreements that include clash action waivers. Um, this issue had been pending uh, for many, many years uh, and originated when the National Labor Relations Board found that these uh, arbitration agreements that included class action waivers violated the National Labor Labor Relations Act, uh, particularly the portion uh, about allowing employees to engage in collective action, uh, group action um, to, uh, to affect change with their employers. Um, 
this ruling has really given us a green light uh, to use class action waivers uh, as a tool for limiting their exposure to potential collective claims uh, from, uh, from employees. The next case I want to discuss is Janus versus the AFS. AFSCME, again, I think you're starting to notice a trend uh, with these five to four decisions um, leaning more on, on the conservative side because that's the current makeup of the court. Uh, and in Janus, um, the court found that requiring individuals who don't want to be union members to pay agency fees violates their First Amendment rights. Uh, this was a harsh blow against public sector unions. It really stripped away the union's ability to collect what are known as agency fees from non-union employees that cover costs associated with collective bargaining if employees haven't given their affirmative consent to paying those fees. Really what this did in a nutshell is it removed a significant source of revenue uh, from public sector unions. Um, only 22 states without right to work were affected by those by, by this ruling, um, and I, I do want to just note um, I often see a little bit of of confusion between the concepts of of right to work versus employment at will. Um, uh, particularly, uh, I found that to be true here in Florida, where I'm located. Um, all right to work means is that in a in a right to work state, if you you join as an employee, a unionized employer, you are not required to join that union. You can act, decline that. In a non-right to work state, if you join a, an employer that has a bargaining unit and your position is within the bargaining unit, you must join the union. Um, whereas all uh, employment at will means uh, is that uh, you or the employee uh, can end the employment relationship for a good reason, a bad reason, any reason at all, as long as that reason is non-discriminatory. I thought this case was very interesting. This was uh, fairly recently, at, at, towards the end of February 2019, uh, in Yovino. Um, the ruling, uh, uh, oddly enough, is deceased judges cannot decide cases. Um, this was a Supreme Court case on appeal from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it involved whether an employer violates the Equal Pay Act by considering a new hire's compensation entirely on the individual's prior salary, or if that salary history uh, is considered a factor other than sex under the Equal Pay Act. Now, in this case, the judge who wrote the Ninth Circuit's opinion against the employer died 11 days prior to the issuance of the decision. So the case had already been decided, the judge had already written the opinion, it was just waiting to be released. And before it was released, that judge passed away. And the Supreme Court said, you, you know what, deceased judges can't decide cases. And because this judge passed away before the issuance of this decision, um, and it essentially was vacated. Uh, so now this case is actually going back before uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, to, uh, to, to be reheard by a new panel. Altitude Express um, is a, a three, case, uh, three cases that have been consolidated um, by the Supreme Court. Uh, and the issue is whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act ban on discrimination based on sex protects LGBTQ employees against bias that is based on either their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Um, what is unique about this case was uh, we've been waiting for some time really to, to get some guidance from the Supreme Court as to whether Title VII's uh, uh, ban on discrimination based on sex protects LGBTQ workers. Um, here in the 11th Circuit, uh, the 11th Circuit said, based on our um, based on our precedent, the answer is no. Title VII does not protect LGBTQ workers. 
other circuits, such as the Seventh Circuit and the Second Circuit, have said, yes, we believe that Title VII is a living, breathing document uh, that uh, has evolved with the times, and that, of course, uh, this prohibition on sex discrimination covers LGBTQ status. Um, so we have this, this conflict uh, amongst the federal circuits. This um, case is also interesting because the the court calls these cases up um, uh, during their meetings, and at least four justices have to agree to hear the case before it's actually docketed um, and, and uh, oral argument is scheduled. Um, in this case, uh, it had been rescheduled for um, uh, a vote, um, I think 13 or 14 times. So this this case has been on the court's radar uh, for quite some time, uh, and only recently um, has the court granted the writ for certiari. Um, and the question that the court is going to consider um, is whether the prohibition uh, in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 against employment discrimination because of sex encompasses discrimination based on an individual sexual orientation. That is the, the precise question that the court agreed to consider. I think it's really worth noting um, that the court considered other questions um, as well as to how they were going to frame the issue. And and I, I think it's noteworthy that one of those questions was something along the lines of, when it was drafted in 1964, did Title VII's prohibition on, on sex discrimination include LGBTQ status? Uh, and the answer is, of, of, of course not. Um, this was not on anyone's radar in 1964 or prior when the bill was being drafted. Um, so I think that it, it, it is certainly not... Um, uh, uh, dispositive as to you know how the the court is going to rule one way or another but I certainly think that for all of the the consternation from certain groups that oh we have a more conservative court now um, certainly they're going to to rule that that title 7 does not protect LGBTQ workers I certainly think based upon the way the issue is framed um, that this is going to get a, a um, really fair and, and you know hard look um, by by the courts. Another interesting case that is currently before the court, and it actually just had oral arguments last week, uh, is Fort Bend County versus Davis. And the Supreme Court in this case is considering whether federal courts can hear a workplace bias claim, even if the employee making it didn't complain to the EEOC before suing. And just as a kind of a broad overview, um, before an employee can bring a Title VII lawsuit against their, their employer, they have to go through the, the administrative process. Um, they're required to file a charge of discrimination uh, with the EEOC uh, or a state counterpart. The EEOC is the federal agency that is tasked with enforcing among other laws, uh, Title VII, and once that that administra administrative process plays out, at the end, usually the EEOC dismisses the charge and issues the charging party what's known as a notice of right to sue. That notice of right to sue provides that charging party with 90 days in which they have to bring a lawsuit based upon their federal law claims. And so what the Supreme Court is looking at here is whether that requirement to file a charge with the EEOC before proceeding to, to uh, litigation is either jurisdictional or whether it's a claim processing rule. If it's jurisdictional, that means the courts cannot hear cases uh, grounded in an EEOC charge. They do not have the power to hear those cases um, because that requirement, that threshold requirement of filing a charge is jurisdictional. If it is ruled to be a claims processing rule, then the courts could hear cases without an underlying charge, but the named employer, the defendant in the action, could still escape the suit by timely claiming that its accuser did not exhaust the requirement that they first complain to the EEOC. Um, 
So I, I would caution everyone to to pay close attention to this case um, because I think that um, if the the court rules that it is a claim processing rule, we might see more individuals um, trying to take advantage of this the fact that it's a claim processing rule and put the onus on us to make that affirmative defense that they did not first file a charge with the EEOC uh, than if it's being ruled jurisdictionally. I've also read several commentators uh, who have noted that during oral arguments, uh, the, the justices uh, express some doubt um, that the uh, uh, that this issue is uh, uh, jurisdictional, that making this jurisdictional would somehow frustrate the purposes of the EEOC, uh, excuse me, of Title VII. So again, it's just one more to to watch out for. Um, and those are really the the cases that the, the big Supreme Court cases that have either already been decided uh, or will be decided um, either this year uh, or in early 2020. Um, I think for um, Altitude Express, the case we talked about a slide previously, given that oral argument I believe is scheduled in October, if I'm not mistaken, that puts the the uh, decision for early 2020 uh, making it a uh, likely hot button election issue uh, for the 2020 election. Now that we've talked about the justices, we're going to move to the legislative branch, the politicians. Um, as, as we all saw uh, back in November, the Democrats won the House and the Republicans won the Senate. So what does that leave us? It leaves us with legislative gridlock. Um, I think what we're going to see is there's going to be um, a lot more increased oversight and scrutiny given that the uh, Democrats uh, control the House. Uh, there's going to be a lot more committee investigations. Uh, it's worth noting that the House and uh, Education and Labor Committee, which is controlled by the Democrats, has jurisdiction over issues affecting the relationship between employers and employees. Um, so we'll likely see an increase in subpoenas, hearings, uh, and investigations into the Department of Labor and the National Labor Relations Act, or excuse me, board. Um, the majority of labor and employment bills stalled in the 115th uh, Congress. Uh, the most significant federal legislative development in 2018 that affected employment law was Congress's omnibus budget bill, the Consolidated Appropriations Act. The reason why this was significant was that it, it amended the FLSA by addressing rules affecting tipped employees and tip ownership. The act prohibits an employer from keeping tips received by employees for any purpose. Uh, this includes allowing managers to keep any portion of an employee's tips, regardless of whether the employer takes a tip credit. Um, I think that's really, really important to note uh, because it, before it, it wasn't necessarily that clear if the employer doesn't take a tip credit, can managers be included uh, in, uh, in tip pools? Um, the act, this act makes it clear. Uh, the answer is no. Um, at no level uh, of management can an employer retain any of the employee's tips. Uh, just as an aside, keeping in mind that tips are different than service charges. Uh, tips are gratuities given for uh, good service based upon the, uh, the, the customer's perceived satisfaction of the service that they received, while a service charge uh, is it belongs to the employer um, because it is included as a, a charge on the total bill. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, was signed into law uh, late December 2017, uh, which I think is important to, to note for two reasons. Uh, the first is that it impacts certain deductions and reporting provisions. Um, uh, for example, it el eliminated through 2025 uh, the exclusion for employer paid relocation expenses, the deduction for employer paid transportation fringe, be fringe benefits, and business deductions for entertainment expenses. The second um, 
uh, reason and the one that I see more often uh, is that it includes a provision that eliminates the business expense related to non-disclosure agreements in connection with the settlement of sexual harassment claims or attorney's fees related to settlements. So if we have a claim brought against the company that includes a sexual harassment claim, uh, that can no longer be included uh, in a, a, a non-disclosure agreement. Immigration policy and enforcement remains President Trump's administrative priority. Um, although there were no immigration-related bills advanced in 2018, uh, employers will likely continue to see uh, increased U.S. immigration and customs enforcement activity, um, as well as U.S. citizenship and immigration services policy initiatives uh, in response to the White House directives on immigration. Uh, federal employment law activity is, has really been confined uh, to regulatory areas. Um, with the National Labor Relations Board, that's joint employment. And with the Department of Labor, uh, that's the overtime rule. And we're going to, to talk about both of those um, uh, fairly extensively. Some labor employment legislation and regulations to watch for in 2019. These are kind of the four, four areas where, where um, I think we need to be directing our attention. Uh, the joint employer rule. Uh, in 2019, the National Labor Relations Board and the Department of Labor are set to take up, um, to narrow, or excuse me, are taking steps to narrow what adds up to uh, joint employment. Um, in fact, the Department of Labor actually released a, um, um, uh, I, oh, I'm sorry, no, that was ind independent contractors uh, that we'll talk about with, uh, with, with opinion letters. Um, we'll also see the Department of Labor's um, new overtime rule that we expect to take place sometime in 2020. Um, we might finally get the EEOC's wellness regulations, and finally we'll actually see the, Depart or excuse me, the Democrats' labor agenda. Um, uh, with respect to minimum wage, we could also see an effort to frustrate the administration's regulatory efforts uh, outlined uh, above. So that's really what's happening on on the politician side, um, where we're going to spend the rest of this presentation um, is really um, within these federal agencies. As I said, this is where a lot of the federal labor and employment law action has taken place uh, over the past year. Just some, some uh, definitional terms for you. Uh, the EEOC is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, that is the agency that is tasked with enforcing certain employment-related laws like Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, and the Age Discrimination in Employment Act. Uh, you have the Department of Labor, um, which is tasked with uh, enforcing the Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, as well as the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA. You have the National Labor Relations Board, uh, which is tasked with enforcing the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, and you have uh, ICE, the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, which is uh, tasked with enforcing the various immigration-related laws um, uh, that, that are currently in existence. We'll start with the EEOC. Um, it, it's really interesting to note the charge reporting statistics that were recently released by the EEOC for fiscal year 2018. And based on those statistics, the employees filed fewer discrimination charges with the EEOC in the, la the last fiscal year than they have in more than a decade. Uh, even as the Me Too movement has spurred a huge surge in sexual harassment reports. So based on the, the number of charges filed, um, you had 76,418 charges in 2018. From the previous fiscal year, that's down 8,000 charges. Employees complain about retaliation more than anything else, followed by sex, disability, and race discrimination. Sexual harassment made up less than a third of the sex discrimination charges, but it's really important to, work, to note there were 900 more of these charges uh, than in the last year. Um, as you can see with this this chart, um, you can really see the the 
how the uh, uh, charge data looks over the past um, almost 20 years. Um, and if, as you can see, there was a huge spike in uh, from 2007 to 2008, and we really had a consistent level of charges filed in those years. Uh, I think it's worth noting um, that those were the years in which uh, the economy was really struggling. Um, people were being let go. Um, we heard anecdotally at that time uh, that uh, employees were rejecting separation packages from their employers thinking uh, that they could get more um, from filing a charge and uh, bringing a lawsuit against their, their former employer. Um, so I do think part of this um, uh, the, this drop in charges is a result of a, the strong economy um, where there is uh, a very low unemployment rate at this time. Uh, and here you can just see the, uh, the, the number of charges by type. The top 10 states with the highest number of EEOC charges in fiscal year 2018, as you can see, are led uh, by Texas, followed by Florida, and Georgia, Pennsylvania, Illinois, California, North Carolina, New York, Virginia, uh, and, and Alabama. There's also been some quorum questions with respect to the EEOC. Uh, the Senate has failed to confirm two nominees for open positions, uh, Daniel Gade and Janet Dillon, uh, and the failure to uh, reconfirm uh, two-term commissioner Chai Feldblum by the end of 2018 uh, meant that there's no longer a quorum, uh, and that's been since two, January 1, 2019. Um, the lack of quorum at the EEOC really has a minimum impact on day-to-day -day enforcement activities. Um, the EEOC is still out there. They're still processing charges. They're still investigating charges. They're still doing their on-site investigations. Um, so this, this um, uh, lack of activity in Washington doesn't necessarily affect uh, the different regional offices of the EEOC. But it's making Chamber of Commerce and other groups, employer groups, unhappy that because uh, Daniel Gade um, served under the Bush administration uh, while Janet Dillon uh, worked in-house for some some uh, large corporations um, and would likely have views more consistent with their own. Uh, the EEOC um, has also been able unable to address a federal judge's order uh, requiring it to collect detailed pay data from employers, uh, which I believe um, either yesterday or the day before, uh, they actually provided that uh, uh, the deadline to provide pay data. Um, but the EEOC has also been able to address regulations concerning uh, health care and workplace wellness plans. I don't think it's, it's any surprise uh, that the EEOC has been very busy over the last 18 months since the Me Too movement. Uh, the EEOC has filed 41 lawsuits accusing employers of sexual harassment in 2018, um, just days before uh, the, the Weinstein story first broke, um, which was more than 50% uh, more than the year before. There were also 7,600 sexual harassment charges, which was uh, also a major uptick over 900 uh, from the previous year. The EEOC also rolled out two new anti-harassment training programs in the midst of this movement. They're looking for ways to encourage employers to treat very compliant and respectful workplaces. 32 states introduced Me Too inspired bills during the 2017-2018 legislative sessions. And seven states actually passed legislation requiring training. Uh, those were California, Delaware, Louisiana, Maryland, New York, Oregon, uh, and Vermont. Um, I do think it is worth noting that um, I think there was some belief in certain circles that the Me Too movement might have been a flash in the pan um, as far as its effect on our workplaces, our policies, what we do. Um, I think that this is absolutely evidence that that's not the case, uh, that the Me Too movement is here to stay. So, you know, regardless of how we 
feel personally, um, you know, about the Me Too movement. Um, the, the simple fact of the matter is it, it's not changing. Um, and either, either we're going to change with it, we're going to take proactive steps uh, to address harassment in the workplace, you know, or we face increased scrutiny not only um, by the EEOC, um, but by um, our, our employees, uh, as well as, quite frankly, um, I believe that the court systems uh, as, as well. With wellness programs, the lack of quorum at the EEOC will push back an answer to an important question for employers. And that question is, how can they encourage employees to take part in wellness programs without being sued? It's, it's very much a catch-22. In 2015, the EEOC issued two rulings that employers can provide incentives worth up to 30% uh, of the cost of self-only insurance coverage without running afoul of bias laws blocking them from forcing employees to disclose health information, which some wellness programs require. A federal court vacated those EEOC rulings as of January 1, 2019, saying the EEOC didn't explain why it picked that 30% level. Um, and that leaves us with this, this lack of clarity as to what we can offer without risking a lawsuit. The EOC is aiming to put out a new proposal uh, in June 2019, according to its most recent regulatory agenda, although it can't do so without a quorum. Um, so again, that, that leaves us in kind of this, this, this quandary of we'd like an answer as to um, what we can do, and we see that a proposal is supposed to be coming down the road, but if there's no quorum, we're not going to see that new proposal. Um, we're also hoping to see the, re the release of long-awaited guidance on workplace sexual harassment. Um, the EOC issued draft guidance in January 2017, laying out its legal interpretation of harassment and recommending best practices for rooting it out and eliminating it in the workplace, but it's yet to be finalized. Um, these uh, uh, EEOC guidance um, positions are are very important not only with what we do and, and how they help us answer questions in the workplace, uh, but they are also afforded um, a certain level of deference by federal courts. Um, so they're very important. I think that um, certainly with respect to the um, uh, this workplace sexual harassment guidance, the fact that it, the draft was released before the Me Too movement, I think further underscores uh, it, its importance. The EEOC recently announced a partnership with the Department of Justice, uh, which will, will allow quicker action on harassment allegations against state and local government employers. Um, that puts those public employers squarely in the EEOC's crosshairs, um, and it signals to private businesses that harassment will remain a top enforcement priority. When we look at charges and try to gauge the EEOC's level of, of whether the charge itself is going to, to catch the eyeballs of anybody at the commission, um, Sexual harassment and certainly systemic sexual harassment, um, it now is always going to catch the eye of the EEOC. So um, we need to be very much aware, aware of that. Uh, the EEOC also signed an MOU uh, with the uh, Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division aimed at combating workplace harassment and other forms of discrimination in the public sector. Uh, this enhanced coordination will allow agencies to move quicker and get immediate action from employers. So that's what's going on with the EEOC. Now we'll shift to gears and talk about the Department of Labor. Um, recently, uh, the Senate confirmed Cheryl Stanton to head the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. Um, and Stanton was nominated more than 18 months ago, um, so that gives you just kind of the, the, the level of gridlock that's currently going on in Washington. Democrats used rules requiring 30 hours of debate for agency nominations to stop votes. Um, however, Republicans voted um, in uh, several weeks ago to reduce debate time on, uh, uh, on trial trial court and non-cabinet appointees to two hours, which allowed the vote uh, on Stanton to go forward. 
uh, the Department of Labor's uh, uh, budget will be cut by almost $1.2 billion under a 2020 budget proposal unveiled by the Trump administration, but the proposal did include money, uh, $750 million, to launch a nationwide six-week paid parental leave program, uh, a 10% cut in budget. Uh, in that proposal, this six-week paid parental leave program leaves it up to the states to implement, uh, and from what I've read, uh, is based upon uh, um, uh, unemployment benefits. So we'll actually see whether states uh, uh, actually move forward uh, and implement that six-week paid parental leave program. In March, the Department of Labor issued the long-awaited replacement of the Obama administration's controversial overtime rule, raising the minimum salary threshold for employees to qualify under the FLSA's white-collar exemptions to $35,308 per year. That's $679 a week. Uh, the proposal is up from... 12,000 from the previous amount of approximately 23,000 and change, but it's still $12,000 lower than what the Obama administration had proposed. Um, coincidentally enough, um, or not, depending on where you are, uh, that 679 per week was actually uh, within $5 of the midpoint uh, of the current 455 a week uh, and what the Obama administration had proposed, which was 913 a week. For highly compensated employees, the Department of Labor raised the, the salary threshold from $100,000 to $147,414, which is actually $13,000 more than what uh, the Obama administration had proposed. Uh, so w what will be interesting uh, is whether we'll actually have individuals who are making more than six figures who are non-exempt and eligible for overtime. The Department of Labor says their new proposed rule will make more than 1 million uh, uh, employees overtime eligible, uh, as opposed to 4 million previously, or excuse me, with the, the Obama administration rule. The proposed rule allows employers to count certain non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments like commissions that their employees receive for up to 10% of the employee's salary level. Significantly, the Department of Labor declined to make any changes to the duties test. This was something that we were concerned about in 2016. It was something that we were again concerned about uh, with the uh, with the Trump administration, um, but they have declined to make any such changes. The only change coming to the uh, the exemptions is the salary basis level. Uh, the Department of Labor also proposed to update the salary level every four years, but doing so only after notice and comment periods. There's no automatic updating like there was with the, uh, the previous administrations. And it's estimated to take place in January 2020. So for all of the hard work that, that we did in the lead up to December 1, 2016, when we thought that the Obama uh, Department of Labor overtime rule was going to go into effect, um, all of that hard work we did in evaluating positions, whether to keep them exempt and raise pay, whether to transition them to, to hourly, um, all of that work we did we can dust that right off um, and use that new figure 679 uh, instead of that 913 to make our our uh, um, a determination of what we'd like to do. Uh, and again, you know, if if you had been to a webinar or a presentation about the new overtime rule in 2016, um, you probably heard the uh, presenter say, don't wait, this is coming, um, it, it's going to be here sooner rather than later, and then it turns out that rule was enjoined. Um, with the, the Trump administration's rule, I don't think that there's going to be as much litigation surrounding it. Um, I, I do think that um, that this is going to go into effect. Um, so uh, my, 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 um, my caution to everyone um, is don't procrastinate. Start taking steps now to evaluate your positions. You know, we don't want to be caught in the position where, um, you know, the new rule goes into effect and we're caught saying, oh my goodness, I thought this was going to be enjoined just like the last one. Um, let's not get to that point and let's have a plan ready um, for, uh, for early part of 2020. 
Um, in 2018, August 2018, the Secretary of Labor announced the Department of Labor's new Office of Compliance Initiatives, uh, and these were um, issued to assist co with compliance efforts of enforcement offices uh, to, and to facilitate and encourage a compliance-focused culture within the Department of Labor and enhance outreach to businesses. Uh, there are new compliance videos and available and websites available through the Department of Labor, um, and it's always worth noting that the Department of Labor is still responsible responsible for enforcing the FLSA and other laws like the FMLA. Significantly as well, we saw the return of opinion letters. Uh, on June 27, 2017, the Department of Labor stated it would return to the practice of issuing opinion letters in response to inquiries from businesses regarding federal wage and hour issues. In 2010, the Department of Labor ceased issuing opinion letters and replaced the process um, by issuing administrative inter interpretations, which were just general guidance on wage and hour issues. Opinion letters, on the other hand, are um, specific inquiries based on real-life scenarios confronting employers that the Department of Labor will then evaluate and give its opinion. Um, this helps to really ensure proactive employer compliance rather than reactive audits and litigation from the Department of Labor. Um, and they're very useful uh, in, in the, the uh, advice that they dispense. Um, I recently handled a Department of Labor wage and hour investigation um, for a construction company, and because the Department of Labor has reissued a, a lot of the opinion letters that had been withdrawn, we were actually able to utilize some of these opinion letters uh, and provide them to the Department of Labor uh, investigator and say, hey, this, this position that you found to be exempt in this opinion letter, opin, excuse me, opinion letter, is the exact same position we have here. Um, so they're very effective tools um, um, for uh, wage and hour compliance. Next, we move to the National Labor Relations Board. Um, as you can see right now, we have a uh, Republican um, uh, majority with the NLRB, uh, and actually Mark Gaston Pierce's um, term expired in August 2018. While he was nominated for a new five-year term, he withdrew his name from consideration, so the seat is now open. So right now, we are in a situation uh, where the board has three Republican members uh, and one uh, remaining. Democratic member. Union membership was slightly down for 2018. Uh, the overall percentage of union employees in 2018 across the nation was 10.5%. Uh, that was down 0.2% uh, from 2017. Uh, there's 14.7 uh, million total unionized uh, work uh, employees, 6.4% um, private sector, 33.9% uh, uh, public sector. Uh, Hawaii and New York have the highest rates of unionized employees, while North and South Carolina have the lowest rates of unionized employees. Typically, um, unionization uh, is far less uh, in, in the southern states. Uh, the number of salaried employees in the labor force actually increased by several million employees in 2018, and the Trump administration will seek to cut the budget of the NLRB by approximately 10%. It's really worth noting that the board is going to renew its emphasis on rulemaking, which is a departure from the norm of an agency that has conducted formal rulemaking really only a few times since its inception in the 1930s. The rulemaking process um, follows the Administrative Procedure Act, and rules are much harder to overturn than precedent set through individual cases. And it's, this, this has to do a lot with this joint employer um, uh, rule. So the board in mid-2018 um, issued a, a decision um, regarding a, its standard uh, for joint employment. Um, the board was actually forced to reinstate an Obama-era ruling known as Browning-Ferris uh, after its ruling several months earlier in a case called Highbrand, uh, which overturned Browning-Ferris, was marred by an ethics controversy involving a board member. 
so, uh, unable to clarify the joint employer standard through um, the establishment of new precedent, the board proposed a rule regarding joint employment that will require evidence of direct control of work conditions before it labels a business as a joint employer. Um, and this is an estimated loss of $1.3 billion to employees uh, and contingent workforces by clarifying the, uh, the joint employer standard in this way. The board may also consider rulemaking regarding the issue of employees' access to employers' property. Another item on the board's priority list involves the speed with which it handles unfair labor practice charge disputes, or C cases, and the board recently developed a four-year strategic plan that called for such cases to be sped up by 5% a year through 2022. The NLRB will release the first in a planned series uh, of regulations revamping parts of the Obama-era union election rule. This spring is the language that they use. Uh, we haven't seen it yet, but we, we expect it soon. Uh, it's going to address the board's so-called blocking charge policy. Um, this invalidates the board's policy of pausing union elections uh, when an unfair labor practice charge is filed, alleging that a party to the election illegally coerced employees to vote a certain way. Um, and it's also going to address the board's uh, voluntary recognition bar. Uh, the current standard prohibits challenges to whether a union has majority support for a certain period of time after the union is voluntarily recognized by an employer. Some significant cases um, in our workplace, um, uh, the, one of the bigger ones uh, came in this Boeing case which addressed workplace rules. And under the old precedent, workplace rules violated the National Labor Relations Act if employees could reasonably construe them to infringe on their rights to engage in concerted activities. This standard was used by the Obama administration to bring charges against employers to challenge a wide range of policies like confidentiality, recording in the workplace, and civility. Uh, if you may recall, um, Several years ago, handbooks were were deeply under scrutiny, uh, and if you ever had a handbook reviewed by a practitioner that said this policy may uh, violate the National Labor Relations Act, th th that's why. Um, the new test that was articulated in Boeing strikes a balance between a given rule's impact on the employee's rights and the employer's reasons for maintaining it, and it created three categories of rules. The first, the rule is always legal because they don't affect the employee's rights or because any interference is outweighed by business interest. The second is rules that are sometimes legal depending on their application. The third are rules that are always illegal because they interfere with employees' rights in a way that are not outweighed by business interest. In another case, uh, the uh, NLRB found that unions cannot make non-members pay for lobbying. Lobbying falls outside of the core representation work that unions can require non-member objectors to fund. The board held that fees paid by these so-called BEC objectors, uh, employees in unionized settings who opt not to join the union, cannot be used for lobbying expenses. Again, because lobbying is not a part of a union's collective bargaining duties. The union must also provide employees with independent verification of audits of what expenses call under categories that BEC objectors' fees can be uh, put under. The NLRB is also uh, easing the path for classifying employees as contractors. Um, the National Labor Relations Act doesn't apply to independent contractors, and in a uh, ruling in the Super Shuttle case, the board will return to an older standard based on common law principles that include entrepreneurial opportunity as a factor in determination of the independent contractor status. This overturned a 2014 Obama administration decision that did not give sufficient weight to entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and finally, um, we come to ICE. Um, uh, ICE has been cracking down on employers suspected of hiring unauthorized immigrants with the number of workplace investigations, internal audits, and arrests uh, jumping by 300 to 750% uh, over the past year alone. 
Um, ICE has launched 6,848 worksite investigations in 2018 compared to 1,691 uh, in 2017. The number of audits went up from 1,360 to 5,981 uh, 5, in that time period. The number of arrests of individuals with past criminal convictions has increased from 139 to 779, uh, and administrative arrests in the workplace went up from 172 to 1,525. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways from, from this slide uh, is ensuring that we are, uh, as an employer, doing our due diligence and ensuring that we are um, accurately completing the Form I-9 process. Um, again, the Form I-9 uh, verifies the individual's identity uh, and their, their ability to work uh, lawfully in the United States. Um, but this is now more than ever, as you can see, uh, very important to do. Um, and I would, um, again, if, if you have questions about, oh, you know, I, I need an I-9 refresher, um, uh, the uh, USCIS actually um, publishes a, I believe it's 75 page um, manual uh, on everything Form I-9. Um, it is freely available to the public. Uh, I would highly encourage you to, to go out and if you have questions, take a look at that because it should answer um, your, your questions. So where'd we go today? So first, we looked at the judicial branch. We talked about judges, uh, particularly the Supreme Court uh, and their recent decisions, as well as the makeover of the federal court system by the Trump administration. Uh, we talked about the legislative branch and the, the politicians and their uh, efforts to legislate or lack thereof. Um, given where we, we are, um, I don't expect this gridlock to let up anytime soon. Uh, and finally, we talked about uh, the president and the executive branch uh, and his administrative agencies and their agendas. You know, I think overall, with respect to the EEOC, uh, the the uh, and the Department of Labor, um, we are seeing more compliance-driven uh, focus from these agencies, um, particularly from the Department of Labor, uh, which is shifting from a more punitive mentality that it had under the, the Obama administration to really punish employers for violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act to more compliance-driven, making sure that employers are actually complying with the law. Um, um, so that was really the, the road that we traveled today. Um, before we get into any questions you all have, I, I just want to take a second and uh, thank you all for, for uh, attending today's webinar. I really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule. Uh, and with that, uh, um, do we have any questions? Um, I think I don't see any questions um, in the go to box. So I think we're good. Okay. Great. Um, so where? Okay. Thank you. Um, where do you go from here? Um, you can contact uh, for any questions or to obtain the link to this live video recording. I believe someone. Um, as that, where to get the recording, you can reach out to your HR consultant or the HR service center, and we can um, give you the link to the recording, as well as you would like a PDF copy of this presentation, we can send that to you as well upon your request. Um, you may also view additional webinar tools at www.coadvantage.com slash resources. We also invite you to some of our upcoming HR Power Hour webinars. Um, you can also view any past webinars at www.coadvantage.com slash webinars. Um, also be sure to register for our next webinar, June 6th. And that one we're going to be presenting on lead in the workplace. Um, so yes, be, be sure to register for the next webinar. Um, last but not least, again, thank you, Brett, so much for this amazing presentation today. If you have any further questions that maybe you didn't get to ask, 
um, during the webinar, feel free to reach out to us. Um, our contacts are listed. And that's it. You guys have a great rest of your day.